Hebrews 8, 8 through 13, the new covenant today. If you have a copy of the scriptures, I encourage you to turn there. It'll be on the screen, but it's always good to open up the scriptures and see for yourself what it says. Hebrews 8, 8 to 13. I like what Justin said. It's the mic drop moment. Good job, Justin. That was good. Hebrews 8, 8 to 13, the new covenant. The new covenant. My name is Pastor Chuck. I've, if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, I'd love to meet you. I'm going to be out in the foyer passing out those door hangers for Trunk or Treat today. And if I haven't met you, please come introduce yourself. I'd love to make your acquaintance. I want, to, I want to remind us from last week, chapter eight. Chapter eight is the post-it note chapter. It only has 13 verses. It's rather short compared to the other chapters in Hebrews. And it reminds us, it quickly reminds us of why the new covenant is so much better and why Jesus had to come from a new priestly line of Melchizedek instead of from the lineage of Aaron. Today's passage is all about replacing the shadows of the Old Testament covenant with the reality found in Christ in the new covenants. The tabernacle, the priesthood, all the holy days and the festivals, they were just shadows of the glory and the salvation that was to come and be revealed in Christ. Let's look at uh, chapter eight, five to seven, just as an on-ramp from, this is a passage from last week, but let's use it as an on-ramp to our passage today. It says this, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he meditates is better. He mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Today's passage picks right up here in verse eight. It picks right up where we left off last week. And it, as, as uh, Justin said, Jeremiah 31 is quoted here. And verse eight says, for he finds fault with them when he says, behold, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The new covenant was formed and put in place because God found fault with his chosen people, the nation Israel. The old covenant and its priesthood could not allow the people to commune with God in his presence. They could never actually be face to face with God. So the Lord declares in verse eight, the Lord declares in verse eight that a new covenant would be established with the offspring of Abraham and the whole world would be blessed in and through it. In this passage, the author of Hebrews on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is quoting directly from Jeremiah 31 to demonstrate that the new covenant is genuine and that it, and it actually takes place. Here in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah is promising hope and the overarching idea of restoration from exile for the people of God. He desires for the people to know that there's hope, to not only know it, but to cling to it and that the Lord will bring his people back to the land and he will complete the promises he made to Abraham and to David. The people, of God's, the people of God's hope is not based on, I wanted to catch it this morning, the people of God's hope is not based on how spiritual they are and how airtight their spiritual convictions were. It's not based on if we have an iron grip on our traditions or if, we, or if the people had darkened the doors of the temple or today we come to church on a regular basis or if we have the Bible memorized or not. The hope of the new and eternal covenant was rooted and is rooted completely in Jesus' transforming grace and how he changes the hearts of his people through his power and in his faithful word. And the reason why, the reason why the old covenant becomes obsolete, as it says in verse 13, is because the old covenant and his priesthood could not allow the people to commune with God in his presence. The significance here of Jeremiah is to show how the Old Testament scriptures themselves, that they, they show, they demonstrate that the Old Covenant is inadequate. It could never make a way for the people of God to come behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies as we can today. 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the houses of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenants, not like the covenants that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I show no concern for them, declares the Lord. It is quite obvious, and I want, us to, I want us to see this this morning. It is quite obvious from the last few chapters in Hebrews that the old and the new covenant are completely different from one another. The old covenant had graceful elements in it. God delivered Israel from Egyptian slavery and victoriously led them out of captivity. Exodus 19, four says, the Lord carried them on eagles' wings. And this verse says, I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. God commanded, he commanded his people in Exodus 20 to follow his laws in response to his grace and his deliverance in their lives. The people still had to keep the commandments in order to receive the blessings of the covenant promised. And if they chose to not obey the commands laid out by God, as it says in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 26, they would be, they would be cursed by the demands of the covenants. At that time, when Jeremiah the prophet is speaking about the new covenant, it is apparent the people of God did not continue it do not continue in keeping and obeying the parameters of the covenant. It was obvious they were choosing to walk their own way. When we were growing up, we lived over on Finsbury, over here, uh, got little John and Finsbury right next to it. And uh, we lived in the Long Brown House, they call it the barracks back in the day. It literally was probably 15 feet wide and about 100 feet long. And uh, we played a game a lot called Airplane. Many of you probably played it growing up. And uh, we would start at the kitchen and it was open from the kitchen, the dining room into the front room. And me or my other brother, John, would get on our back and Brad and Amy would run at full speed. That wasn't real fast for policy. We don't move real fast, but he, they run at full speed. They, they took off, they jumped. Uh, we would hit them in the stomach with our feet and fly them back into the couch. You can see why it's called airplane. My dad walked in seeing us do this one day and he says, I would stop doing that. It is not gonna end well for you. But we did not listen. And we chose to do it our own way. And especially when he was not home, we chose to do it over and over again. Luckily, praise the Lord, I'll say this, I was not there when this happened. But brother John and Brad were playing airplane. And Brad took off at a Posley type speed and took off across the uh, dining room, the uh, kitchen, and was going over into the front room, jumped off the steps, hit John's feet. John propelled him into the air. Brad did a perfect Iron Eagle in the air like this, landed but missed the couch completely, and put his knee through the wall with a hole about this big, right through the drywall. And both of them sat there. I heard the noise, I was upstairs, mom and dad were at home. And I walked down and I go, <laughs> <laughs> I was probably 13 or 14. I was like, I am so glad that wasn't me. And John and Brad, I walked down and John and Brad, instead of, instead of telling mom and dad, he took one of the big throw pillows and put it against the wall. And it covered it very nicely. About a week and a half later, <laughs> a week and a half later, dad is cleaning. And he pulls the throw pillow, takes the throw pillow off and puts it on the couch and goes, boys, <laughs> you ever been there? It's not a good sound. And uh, we walked down and I saw what had happened and I said, it wasn't me, it was them. And I turned around and walked away. <laughs> and Brad and John had to sit there and explain to dad what happened. But more importantly, why they chose to hide it and cover it up. It was apparent the people of God did not continue in keeping and obeying the parameters of the covenant. They did not listen. Because of their disobedience, the kingdom of Israel was divided. They were shown discipline by God. 
And both Israel and Judah faced exile because of their disobedience and their outright rebellion against the covenant they had made with God. Verse nine B says this, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. I love how the NIV says this, the Lord turned away from them. God here is not caring. He's removed, I've removed my favor, he says in another version. And there's still another way they experience the curses of the old covenant. The people of God were guilty because of their disobedience as we are today. But the limitations of the old covenant is glaring here as well. Israel did eventually return from exile, but the people again chose not to obey God as we see in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Judges. They did not put their allegiance fully under his banner. And so the old covenant promises never came together. They never materialized that they were supposed to. Schneider says this, it is interesting when the New Testament opens, Israel is being ruled and dominated by Rome and is technically in exile and bondage again because they are still choosing to disobey the law of God. Verse 10, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. The author here in verse 10 starts to delve into Jeremiah 31 and what the new covenant is all about. Establishing a new covenant would be able to solve the continual sin and rebellion problem that the people of God had. The promises God made to Abraham in Genesis cannot be fully drawn out, cannot be fully fulfilled unless the people start to fully follow and obey their God. For this is the covenant. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. The Lord declares. He shouts it from the mountaintops. He will be the one that makes the new and lasting covenant. The author of Hebrews and believers today see this new covenant is fulfilled and realized in the cross and the resurrection, the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. But under the old covenant, the law, the law was an external thing that the people tried to follow. But in the new covenant, God implants his commands, his desires, his character, and his will directly into the minds and hearts of his people. I love what it says in Deuteronomy 36. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and your heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live or you may truly live. The Lord does surgery on our hearts and implants his truth into the very fabric of our lives. He makes and allows us to desire him and his word. And in turn, we as his children desire and want to follow after him with everything that we have. I love the last part of this. I will be their God and they shall be my people. The old covenant was external. It was totally corporate. It was totally traditional. But now the new covenant, we worship not only corporately together as a body, I love doing that, but our worship to our Savior is also very personal, personal, internal, and different for all of us. We worship our God in spirit and in truth because his truth has been implanted in our minds and hearts and the living word has changed our lives. Today, has Jesus changed your life? We worship our God in spirit and in truth. The living word has come into this world and has changed those who believe in him. They, he has changed their lives so they live differently. They dwell on things differently and they want to live for their savior because he has come into their life and made them his, his own possession. Has Jesus changed your life? He is the living word. 
He is the truth that has been implanted into our lives. He is the whole reason why the new covenant is different and worth giving our whole selves to. Let me ask you this. I want you to really dwell on it this morning. Has Jesus changed your families and friends' lives? The life-changing power of the gospel is what should get us up each morning. It's what, it's what is, it is what should drive and compel us to tell and declare to those you know who desperately need Jesus It's life-changing sacrifice to change their lives. We all know people. Every one of us know people in our lives that need Jesus to come into their life, to cleanse them of their sins and to change them. When was the last time? When was the last time you actually shared the gospel verbally with someone you truly cared about that needed Jesus? If he's the true word, if he's the living word that comes in this world and changes our lives from the inside out, when was the last time verbally that you shared the gospel with someone you truly care about? When was the last time, brother and sister, that you invited someone to church? If we believe that Jesus through the new covenant has the power to change lives, we must be in the business of sharing the gospel. We must be in the business of inviting our friends, our family, our coworkers, and everybody we know to church because we know what can change your life. We know what they're missing. And it is a crime for us to hold that back. Do you truly believe Jesus through the word and the new covenant has the power to change people's lives for eternity? Do you truly believe that? Do you believe Jesus' life-changing gospel has the power to save your family and friends' lives, our city, our country, and this world for Christ? Are you living that way in the power of the gospel, in the power of the new covenant, in the power of the living word of God, Jesus Christ himself? I believe that with all my heart. I believe that Jesus Christ can change lives, can change this world, can change our country, can change our county, our city, our church for Jesus Christ. And that's what the new covenant does. He has come to change the world with his gospel, his grace, his love, and his truth. The staff and I, the elders, we have a big vision. We have a big vision for grace and God can use us in the Miami Valley, our Jerusalem, for the cause of Christ. We'll be sharing that more in the coming weeks and months. But we really believe that grace can be a lighthouse to our community. And it starts with each one of our individual lives, really understanding how the grace of God, the gospel of God, has the power to change every single life in Troy and Miami County for his glory. Do you believe the gospel can change people's lives? Our almighty father is on the move in this world. And he's in the business of changing lives and bringing people to himself through his life-changing gospel. And I wanna be part of that and I want grace to be part of it as well. And that's what I'm praying towards. The new covenant is superior to the old covenant because commands of God, his will, his desires are written and engraved on the minds and hearts of the people. Another part of the new covenant and how it differs from the old covenant comes to the forefront here in verses 11 and 12. Look at them with me. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Israel, the people of God, under the old covenant, had both believers and unbelievers in the covenant community. So the people in the community had to be taught what it meant to know, follow, and love the Lord. Not all who were circumcised as Israelites under the old covenant believed in Christ. In the new covenant, it's saying here in verses 11 and 12, 
There is no need to share the gospel of salvation in the covenant community in the new covenant because we all know Christ. And Jesus has changed our lives. The Holy Spirit resides in us as brothers and sisters in Christ under the new covenant because it says here, every brother, every fellow citizen will know the Lord. Yahweh says himself, they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. Everyone truly under the new covenant has new life in Christ because Jesus commands, Jesus' words, his will, and his desires are engraved on, the, on their minds and on their hearts. It's the very word of God. Jesus Christ himself, his imprint will be on every area of your life as a child of God. He affects every part of it. I want you to think back to January and February in our series in Titus. This is a familiar passage, Titus 2, 11 through 14. But it really hits home when we're talking about the new covenant. Look what it says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. His salvation changes us. Verse 13, it says, waiting waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works, who are passionate for good works. His imprint is on every facet of our lives. Philippians 2.20 says this, our citizenship is in heaven and we wait a savior from there. The new covenant in and through Christ is all about a changed life, a changed direction and a changed and new future. Today, the church, the descendants of Abraham by faith consists of children of God from every area of the globe. Now, that does not mean that everyone that goes to church, and we know this to be true, is a Christian. That's far from the truth. But the ones who are genuinely apart and under the new covenant have the commands of God inscribed on their minds and their hearts. They have been given new life by the Spirit of God and through the power of the Word of God. That's how change happens. The Holy Spirit pursues you. The Holy Spirit calls you to himself. The Holy Spirit through the Word of God shows you that you are a sinner and that you are in need of Jesus. And he changes your life when you say, Jesus, I need you to come in my life. I need you to save me and cleanse me from my sins. Ezekiel 36 is talking about this same thing kind of the parallel passage of Jeremiah 31. It says this, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. When a child of God When a child of God has the spirit of God living in them, and just for a second, think about that. What an amazing truth. What an amazing, incredible reality that the spirit of God chooses. Jesus himself, the Trinity chooses to live within us, to reside in us, to walk with us every single day. When we know Christ as our savior and the spirit through the word of God is living within us, We will be tied to the truth of the word of God and we'll desire to live for and please God with our very lives. Now, this does not mean, we all know this, this does not mean we won't struggle in our faith and with our sin. But the Holy Spirit, God himself, promises to reside, to walk with us, to guide us, and even chastise us when when it's needed. So we are always striving after Christ every day. Verse 12 It gives us the reason God's people truly know the Lord. Their new life in Christ is rooted in the forgiveness of their sins. And our sins are remembered no more. They are completely forgiven. I love what it says, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities. And I will remember their sins. I will remember their iniquity no more. The author through the inspiration of the Spirit 
we'll continue to flush out the beautiful reality of, of the forgiveness of our sins in the next couple chapters as Luke talked about at communion and how Jesus brings true and everlasting forgiveness. But verse 13 here, I love this because it, it really is the hammer dropping. It really is where here the spirit is working in the author of Hebrews and he wants us to look at the post note of chapter eight, the verse th 13 verses. And in verse 13, he says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The talk and the fulfillment of a new covenant makes the first one not useful anymore. It's not needed. Schneider says again, the author doesn't envision here a situation where the old and the new covenants coexist. The old isn't better or even held in high esteem here, but it is considered obsolete. It's considered ready to be vanquished, ready to vanish away and be seen no more. The old has now disappeared completely in how we as children of God relate to our heavenly father. We now have complete access and redemption through Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection. As children of God, because of the new covenant, because of Jesus' sacrifice for our sins, because of Jesus defeating death and rising again, we can walk into the presence of Yahweh, God the Father, the Trinity, and commune with them at any time. We can read scripture and hear our Savior's words to us. We can be on our knees before our Father, crying out and declaring who he is and praising who he is that we did this morning, but also we can cry out for the things that we need, we desire, we see in our people's lives that they need. We can cry out for the salvation of our friends, our family, and the God of the universe, Yahweh himself, wants and desires to listen to us. That's what the new covenant gives us as children of God. We stand clean and sanctified in Jesus. Jesus is the anchor of our souls. And under the new covenant, we stand as redeemed children of God today if we know Jesus as our Savior. Do you know Jesus as your Savior today? Has Jesus cleansed you from your sins? Do you understand what it means to be able to walk into the presence of God himself and cry out to him? Because if you become to know Christ as your savior, you have that privilege, that honor every single day, like we that know Christ, to pray to our father. To read his word and let the Holy Spirit work in our life to help us understand it, help us to live it and grow through it. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior today, come find me when I'm passing out to those door hangers. Talk to Dan, talk to Dave, talk to Alyssa on stage. We wanna show you through the scriptures how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus and how he, through the new covenant, can change your life for eternity. I want you to dwell on the words of this song this morning. We're gonna sing it in a few moments. All sufficient merits. Think about these words. I lay down my garments any empty boast. Good works now all corrupted by the sinful host. I am dressed in my Lord Jesus, a crimson robe made white. No more fear of judgment, his righteousness is mine. All sufficient, all sufficient merit, firm in life and death. The joy of my salvation shall be my final breath. When I stand accepted before the throne of God, I'll gaze upon my Jesus and thank him for the cross. The chorus says this, it is finished, it is done. No more debt I owe, paid in full, all sufficient. Merit, not my own. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory, praise, honor to his name. Father, today, thank you for the new covenant. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your perfect life. Thank you for your righteousness on our account. Thank you for rising again, Jesus, and being our savior today, our, li our living savior, that we can truly understand what it means to live a life that has freedom and one day see you face to face. And that, thinking about that, Jesus, makes me wanna shout hallelujah. Holy Spirit, thank you for choosing to reside with me, choosing to walk with me every single day. I don't deserve any of that. None of my brothers and sisters in Christ in this room deserve, Jesus, your salvation. Holy Spirit, we don't deserve you residing with us, walking with us. It's nothing in our own merit. It's all because of your grace, all because of your mercy, all because of the new covenant. That's why today, Jesus, we praise you. We lift you high. We honor you. And I pray that this week, we would take the time to share the gospel with someone in our circle of influence. That we would invite someone to church because we need, in the days that we are living today, we need to be sharing the gospel wholeheartedly because we know what it takes for a person's life to completely be changed for eternity. Helps us take that seriously and not dawdle. In your name. Amen.